temporomandibular joint disorders are problems that can dominate many people's lives. This relatively small joint can become incurable and there are so many different ways and different ideas out there that it can leave many people exasperated to know what answers to choose and many people who have tried all of the methods with no alternative and no direction to go in. What I want to try and explain in this short presentation is some interesting observations and try and overview the entire subject in a way that I don't think you'll find anywhere else. I'm an orthodontist practicing a technique called orthotropics that has taken a very different view of the orthodontic problem, trying to understand what the causes of the problem are and from that trying to generate answers. And the philosophy and the concept that I have behind the orthotropic theory gives many indications for what's going on within the jaw joint. We're all working on the same head. And specialists from one area can easily understand or should easily understand what's going on in another area. So, temporomandibular disorders, what's going on? The anatomy of the structure is you have the condyle that runs from the jaw joint, so that's the condyle of the mandible, that runs along a smooth surface on the undersurface of the temporal bone. It can rotate and it can slide. In a normal situation, the joint is centered, what we refer to as centric, for no other reason than when we take an x-ray, you can see it's centered nicely, it's well balanced. And in many disease situations, you tend to find the joint has been displaced upwards and backwards within the joint so that when you bite together the joint is in the wrong position. It's not centered, it's not centric. And this seems to cause a lot of problems. The cartilage that normally sits on top of this disc to get, tends to get displaced forwards because it's the only place where there's space for it and there's damage at the back of the disc, often rheumatic, arthritic type damage to the uh, joint and these problems they're almost incurable. They're, it's, it, it dominates people's lives. It destroys lives for no other word. It, 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 it's, it's terrible and I completely understand the people who feel they're losing their minds with situations like this because it can become co debilitating. Now what information do we know about this? What um, information outside the box that contradicts uh, the information we assume we know? Because we know we've got lots of people with the problem. We, uh, there's a debate as to whether orthodontics is associated with this problem. There's a large body of evidence that says this isn't true. There are smaller bodies of evidence that say orthodontics does relate to jaw joint problems. And there's, a, there's an argument, um, obviously there have been some legal situations as well. Some interesting out-of-the-box information that um, interested me was a Scandinavian researcher called Lund. And Lund argued that, well, suspected that most medical doctors in the accident and emergency or the ER room would not diagnose a fractured condyle on most children. And he was exactly right. He took a large body of children under the age of 12 and younger. He took their x-rays from the historical records of accident and emergency ER rooms within Scandinavia, the area he was in. 
and he looked at the x-rays and he diagnosed many condylar fractures that had not been diagnosed previously or weren't diagnosed at the time, which meant that the individual had had a fracture of their condyle, this entire process was broken off, and they were released from hospital, they were allowed to go home, and in effect, they were an experimental study subject. He then managed to contact many of these individuals and look at what actually happened. Now, when the condyle, the head of the mandible, is um, fractured, the pterygoid muscles pull that section back. It is then resorbed, it disappears, and a new joint, a completely new joint, has to be made. Um, the pterygoid muscle has to thread itself back through the joint complex. A new head has to be made, a new um, uh, cartilaginous disc, a new capsule, everything has to be reformed. Now, the interesting thing he found was that in 95% of the cases, the children had almost perfectly normal growth and re-established a completely normal joint. In only 5% of the cases where they got infection, did they have real problems. And I think that more relates to the pathology of infection than the pathology of having a fractured joint. Um, interesting, this has been observed in older groups, um, people as old as 30 years old, it's been observed anecdotally, and this has been reported on in the literature. Now, it's, it's also true within orthodontic therapy that we create changes within the condyle. When you place in what are referred to as functional appliances, there is possible, particularly in the research done on um, herbs appliances, to see a lengthening within this, jo this joint, the condyle, that it's possible for um, the condyle to change. Now, there's also been um, some cases reported in um, the literature, I think from East Grinstead Hospital in Surrey, where a section, a cartilaginous section of the ribs was removed. <clears throat> it was placed behind the condyle and this caused the mandible to move forwards into a different position that was the desired result of this procedure. Now, that's almost a completely barbaric thing to do. You've, you've just pulled the jaw forward, placed a bit of cartilaginous bone or cartilage um, from the ribs behind the joint, and later, when these joints were analysed, they looked perfectly normal. Now, why, then, is this incredible adaptability capable when, in some individuals, when in other individuals, almost nothing seems to help them? I've, I've had the privilege of working in several continents, and I have, in my lecture trips and travels around the world to see what other people are doing, which of course fascinates me. I've uh, been into most of the continents on the planet and I've been able to observe what orthodontics they've done and incidentally I've also observed what type of treatment is available from temporomandibular dysfunction because of course it not only changes in time but it also changes in different areas by different, uh, in different times. So depending on when you are in the world will depend what type of treatment you get for temporomandibular dysfunction. And the possible treatments range from surgery to physiotherapy. Um, the, in the Europe and America at the moment, splints are very popular. Placing a splint between the teeth, either on the top or the bottom, there's a hundred different names for these particular different types of splints. Um, uh, and they work in different ways, from reflex liberating splints to flat splints. Um, the Michigan Sprints, there's more ideas on this than I could go through. Uh, you could also have your joint um, lavaged, you could have steroids placed in the joint, you can have the joint manipulated, you can see a chiropractor, you can see an osteopath, you can see a hypnotist. Um, the Eastman Hospital in uh, the UK at the moment 
or has been handing out tricyclic antidepressants. Um, you can see a psychiatrist for these problems. Um, it, the, the list goes on. Um, and when you evaluate all the different ideas and concepts, the one overriding um, conclusion that can be drawn is that 50% of these people must be wrong. They can't all be right. And yet, the five-year survival or five-year success of any of these treatments tends to be around 50%, nearly all of them. The only one with a slightly higher um, rate of success is surgery, and it's not much more successful. And the cynics would suggest that this is because you cut so many nerves in the process of doing the surgery that you feel less pain afterwards. And there might well be something in that. Now, when we stop to think what's causing this. I notice that nearly no one within this group is actually putting forward an explanation for why this problem is occurring in the first place. Why there is a difference between when your teeth are apart, the joint seems to be centered, and when the teeth are together, the joint seems to be set back. So as the joint is coming together, the teeth are coming together, the joint's going too far back. We seem to have assumed that this is just the way it is, without asking why. The great question of why this occurred in the first place should help lead us to understanding how to correct the problem. Now, this is where the concept of orthotropics comes in, because orthotropics is asking why are teeth crooked, rather than making the assumption that it's purely genetic. And this theory lends itself to what's going on within jaw joint problems and what's causing temporomandibular dysfunction, dysfunctions of the temporomandibular joint. Within the orthotropic theory, we have looked to what environmental factors may be influencing the growth of the facial shape in general. There is clearly some environmental factors, and these seem to be the changes of muscle tone and the changes in posture, effectively, if you have weak muscles and if you hang your mouth open from previous breathing issues, then your face will be slightly longer. And if your face is slightly longer, it's going to be the, the dental spaces, should I say the vital spaces, are going to be narrower and shallower. And that vital space includes your airway, your tongue, and your teeth, the dental arches. Obviously, your airway is vitally important. And it causes many people to posture their head forward slightly to maintain a good airway, like the first bit in resuscitation, where you dip someone's head back. It provides more space. And at the same, and then to put their tongue between their teeth. Because this is helping get some of the bulk of the tongue up out of the airway so you can breathe comfortably. Now, if you do that much of the time, then you are holding the mandible apart, open, by four to five millimeters. If that then becomes your habitual resting or postural position, then the jaw joint, like all of the joints within my body, is going to reform so that it's centered, centric, in that position with a slight opening of the teeth. And that's what we think is naturally going on. Most people, or a large percentage of the population, have their tongue between their teeth much of the time, with the teeth apart about four or five millimeters. Now, when these individuals close with their teeth together, the jaw joint is now too far back. It's no longer centric. Now, the jaw joint is a pretty tough but small mechanism, and it can cope with that in most situations. If you don't eat particularly hard foods, which generally modern humans don't, 
than the jaw joint copes quite admirably. However, this becomes a particular problem in the people who decide to clench their teeth together. Biting hard at night for stress, or even they enjoy tough food. And it's those individuals that have these two separate factors, stress and clenching, and a joint that's in an incorrect position, that go on to get temporomandibular dysfunction. It's never going to get better. It's not going to get better because you, or the individual concerned, continues to dictate a resting position that's not the same as their biting position. What is very useful is placing a splint between the teeth because what this effectively is doing is changing the biting position. It means you bite earlier. You bite when the joint is still centered. You are filling up the space that the tongue was taking up. Now the problem with that, and one of the reasons I think that splints don't have a long, five, good five-year success rate is that where is the tongue going to go now? Sometimes you will have produced enough of vertical space that the tongue has space and it feels comfortable. You can still get some of the tongue up out of your airway. And those cases will be cured permanently. And they're the 50% that go on. But the 50% that don't go on, they will be individuals that then place their tongue on top of the splint or underneath the splint, depending where the splint is then leading to further changes in the jaw joint. Now, how do you cure something like this? How do you actually make a permanent change? How do you help these people? Well, that's for our next video.